Now, the, the questions that are most fun for me are cir uh, circle management questions. For example, what happens if in the middle of an introduction of an activity, a child or several completely tune out and start doing something very different? I'll ask you right back, what if you tune out? <laughs> what happens if the leader loses track of thoughts? Or uh, once it happened to me in an online event, I passed out. That was my 10th event of the day, and I was traveling, and I uh, had an allergic reaction and lost consciousness for a bit. Uh, um, I hope nothing like quite like that happens to any of you. But uh, it happens that people come in and out with their attention, and it happens to everyone, including us leaders, uh, make it a part of your routine to have mental and physical places for people to go when they disengage. So have some sort of signal for when everybody comes together. I do like to clap. Uh, some people think it's childish, but we clap pretty complex patterns sometimes, and my kids don't mind. Uh, so uh, some people like to wave like this. That's from California. They taught me that. Uh, if you wave like that, everybody waves, and then everybody pays attention. And then this uh, use that sparingly. So a few times uh, a circle when you really want to bring people together. At other times, people come in and out of it, and it's you can design for that to happen, that you have this robust thing where some people are playing here, some people are playing there, and if some tune out, the show goes on. All right. Speaking of some people playing here, some people playing there, what if a Children seem to be very eager to do an activity, and then like a minute or two into it, or a very short time into it, they just drop it, and they either get up and move away physically, or again they um, you know, start doing something else. Um, one of my favorite circles was when my whole group ran away. And they ran away even before I could start. So um, what happened was, um, and this was a very eager group with kids who really worked well together. So it, it's, uh, it was in the middle of a multi-week session. We all knew one another. We were comfortable. So one day I'm sitting there, and uh, the kids are not coming in. And I look out the window, they are all outside. So it was as a day kind of like we have now um, with um, beautiful October sunny weather and a lot of leaves falling. And so I looked outside and walked out and all my kids were in a giant leaf pile by the oak and playing and having great time of it and not coming anywhere near what we planned for the day all together. So they all ran away. So I jumped into the pile with them because the day was glorious. <laughs> and I uh, just, uh, we kind of tumbled in the leaves for a while. And then um, I said, uh, well, uh, how are things going? What's that? And they said, oh, yeah, mass circle. Let's." Um, Let's do something. We, uh, it came to them wondering how many leaves are in the pile. And we spent the next hour trying to answer this question. Turned out the pile had about a million leaves. So that was a, an interesting exploration for uh, my kids who were about six to eight year olds to count to a million with their hands, with their bodies playing in the leaves, uh, having a glorious day. So uh, I guess the point is if you can't uh, have kids come to you, you can follow them. You can ask them um, what um, is going on in their world, what is happening, what they are interested in. But also don't discount uh, the fact that some kids seem to be tuned out, but they are not. And there are actually some studies of uh, very weird things happening with kids who are to the side tuned out, turn out to absorb much more 
or as, as much as everybody else. And I've seen it many times, you've probably seen it in the families where you are having a conversation with, uh, you know, grown-up family members and the kid is doing something totally else and suddenly the kid is very aware of what you are discussing. So, um, we can all relate to that. Uh, and again, it's like the first question, have ways of uh, to incorporate it into what's happening. Some people will tune out, some people will run away. If the activity you planned, like what I planned for that leave day, I was kind of fond of, so I kind of pinned it to the bulletin board and said, oh, I had a thing planned, everybody, but we'll do it later and come back to it later. Wow, that sounds such like such a beautiful math circle that you have with with the leaves. Wow, it was it was fun and it was very meaningful mathematically, pre pretty deep exploration at the end. But um, who would expect it? Right. So the next question is, what if? And again, this happens a lot. Uh, you ask kids to solve a problem, and they don't even stop to think about it, but just shout out answers that are pure guesses. They're so wildly off base that uh, there is absolutely, you, you can uh, see that there is no thinking involved. But once one child starts shouting out guesses, uh, many other children tend to jump in and also just guess. So what do you do then? Well, um, there, is a, there is a story I read as a child called the celebration of disobedience, the, the holiday of disobedience. <laughs> and I guess for many children, this uh, when they do things wildly or totally unrelated, um, well, they are, uh, you know, running for freedom, maybe. So they are celebrating their wild side, where the wild things are. But also, um, so you, it may be a signal you need to loosen up a bit. Um, but some kids uh, do it as a habit, so they would do it even in a very loose, free situation. <laughs> so. Um, I guess um, this goes for jokes, um, so what is two plus two? A million. Uh, the kid knows it's not a million, it's uh, a joke. Uh, uh, they, they just want, uh, uh, they want something else out of the activity. So uh, you listen to them attentively, it's an active listening technique. What is it kids are trying to do, basically? So you can guess, the guesser. You can guess what they are trying to do. If they are guessing like that, uh, they may be afraid of um, trying to think deeply and investing in an answer and being wrong. So what you can try to do is, I guess, you can just, if you think that's what's going on, if they are trying to solve it but don't, don't feel like investing themselves, you can say, OK, let us capture the guesses, and you can write them on the whiteboard, everybody's ideas. And then slow kids down a bit and say, oh, we have such beautiful variety of ideas. Let us go through them and check them. So you, you redirect from you solve it to we check it. That gives kids some safety. OK? If kids are fooling around and joking, they uh, maybe it may be that the question you asked is too mundane or too easy or uh, not engaging to them. So that's quite the opposite problem. They are not afraid of it; they are bored of it uh, for for this being too easy. So if this, if you suspect this is the case, uh, you can say, "Oh, well, two pl two plus two is a million. Well, maybe, but what what would give you a million?" Uh, you can acknowledge, ha, huh, that was funny, but, uh, well, let's take a million if you seem to like the number. <laughs> let's do something fun with it. And you turn it on to kids and say, well, what, what question would have this answer? Or you can do this thing where you celebrate mistakes on purpose. If you think kids are tired, maybe, or if they need more freedom, you need to loosen up. You say, okay, I'm going to give a question. And everybody, go for the wrong guest answer you can do. 
just go as bad a mistake as you can make and then you can have a pretty cool discussions of what makes a glorious mistake, what makes a cool mistake, a weird mistake, all sorts of basically making mistakes on purpose. That's very therapeutic for kids who are unsure of themselves but also it's uh, for everyone, it's, it's a creative math activity that they can try. So wow, this celebrating mistakes, the idea just brings a smile to my face. It's, it's just so much fun. Um, okay, so we're celebrating the mistakes and then we get back to the activities. Um, and the children solve the puzzles, do the problems. Uh, explore the challenges at, di at different speeds. Some children in the circle might be much faster than others. Uh, some might be uh, a bit slower than others. And so we get the situation where some kids are, who are faster might sit there and be bored. And the kids who are a bit slower, even though they're on the right track and they're doing great, they might feel a little bit um, left behind and uncomfortable. What to do in this situation? Well, uh, this is um, pick the slowest child go at that pace, right? No. <laughs> okay. Pick the fastest child go at that pace. Okay. Yes. Um, I am giving you great recipes for disaster now. Okay. So um, what? Uh, I think I like to address this one by choice of activities. So um, there are things you can do that are on rails, like solve this problem and it has this answer. And then the, the question of how fast is very acute. This works, but this works great for tiny questions, like what do you think the next number in the sequence would be? If you are exploring the sequence and you have a bigger problem, and you have this one tiny question. For things like that, there are devices. For example, you can have a rule like we don't talk for a while. We don't talk. We, I'm going to ask you a question. Write your thought. And then we'll go around the circle and ask everyone. This uh, helps kids to learn how to contemplate. And this is a good value in mathematics. We'll get to values in the further weeks. But uh, it's a good value to pause and think, even if you know answers. It also uh, instills respect to everybody in the circle or everybody's voice. Because there are some power things going on. There are gender issues. Uh, there are introverts, extroverts. It's very easy for um, a totally anarchy situation uh, to get to where some people never get to say anything uh, because of who they are or how they are or who other people are. So that prevents it. You basically take terms, you, turns, you have your conch shell going around and whoever holds it speaks. But uh, you can design activities um, where kids uh, go totally wild and everyone shouts. Uh, uh, but uh, this is this has to be timed, and um, they get tired of it soon. Uh, you can, uh, but generally, what you design for uh, is activities where there are many possible answers and different answers, and this way and different ways to ask questions. So uh, the great example of that in sciences are Fermi problems that are open to different interpretations. So we had a, one problem like that in a circle. That was some uh, in the same group that counted the leaves, but sometime later. So they asked how many people are in a town. And of course, a quick way to answer it, and someone uh, maybe who wants a quick way is to go to the town hall website and look it up. Uh, but also, they got into the discussion of, well, what if there is a festival and a lot of people come in? Uh, what if uh, somebody is born today? Well, won't there be another person in town? What if someone passes away? Uh, what if relatives are visiting? Just So we got into all these complex discussions of the same question, and different people took it in different ways. Always ask 
about these quicker ideas, you can ask others to open them up, to, re to find some more math in them, uh, in those quicker ideas, and then the quicker ideas become slower. But that's what our experienced leaders said last week, all of them, uh, and, um, or maybe it was in, in the other pieces of interviews, but they all say that at some point uh, that um, the slower you can go, uh, the deeper kids are thinking and uh, the more mathematics you generally get done. Let's, let's wrap up this video with an anecdote. So what is the strangest and most disruptive thing that ever happened to you in a math circle? Now for me it was, uh, you know, I had a small math circle meeting at my house and uh, one of the children decided to spend some time under the table, which I don't mind um, as long as they're comfortable there. But his mother said uh, very sternly, she said, get out from under the table at once. And the child just jumped out from under the table and jumped right on the table then, which was kind of like, wow. But at the same time, it was funny. And of course, you know, all the children started laughing and trying to jump under and on the table. And that, that was like, before we calmed down, it was like 15 or 20 minutes of the math circle time. So uh, what about you? Um, well, I have a habit of sitting on tables. And in general, my math circles are active. So I guess this is kind of a routine for me almost. <laughs> <laughs> and that <laughs> tells me that one person's um, wild activity can be another person's norm. Uh, but uh, n not quite norm, but if you look at p pictures of my mass circles, almost everyone has someone on the table at some point, <laughs> either sitting, but well, maybe not jumping. That's interesting. Okay. So, but uh, it's, uh, it's really um, the point I'm trying to make is for different people, different things are routines. And one day there was a, uh, we, we were having a circle at the house and uh, uh, at, at my house and there, there was somebody at the door and so I opened the door and in comes uh, what turned out to be a bounty hunter. So uh, we had a <laughs> bounty hunter uh, hunting one of our neighbors uh, for, for something uh, I didn't know, he didn't say, but uh, th that's what it was and the kids were kind of uh, a bit uh, shocked at that and, and um, we made a lot of Star Wars jokes of course <laughs> uh, later, but uh, it, it was an interesting event and uh, as with everything else we ask kids where is mathematics and that so we had a little bit of a discussion but um, I don't know where mathematics is in that uh, so uh, so uh, that was one thing but um, kids um, I I do find that when kids jump or do something moving like that it tends to be disruptive for a long time so we we have this little speech about um, children, um, well, about us and saber-toothed tigers. Like back in the caveman days, we had to be very careful about the saber-toothed tiger moving in the bushes. So anytime we see big movements, we all have to pay attention to that. We can't not pay attention to gross motor movements, to large movements there. So kids, uh, we kind of talk about uh, kids being aware that when they make a big, big movement, they become the center of attention. And what does it do for other people? Are they trying to concentrate on something else at the time? But it's a playful conversation about unexpected things. And uh, uh, you, you have those stories too about something totally weird happening and what you did about it. <laughs> So and um, hopefully uh, what we all do about it, it's something mathematical or maybe it can be retrospectively mathematical. Um, we can get together with kids and talk about it. Remember when we all jumped on tables? Well, that was all about parabolas because that's how the gravity works. <laughs> okay, thank you everyone. Well, thank you everyone for listening to, uh, to us. And what we want you to do is to ask us questions. Uh, you can ask in the thread with this video and share your own stories and your own ideas on how to solve 
either serious answers or very absurd, very funny solutions, perhaps not realistic. Like, so we'll see you next week. Thank you.